Uh, welcome to this education session. Everybody throws from both sides organised by the New South Wales Joint Officials Committee. Now, this session aims to explore the throws from both an officials and a coach's perspective. And my name is Darren Wenzer. I'm the Head of Coach and Volunteer Development with Little Athletics New South Wales. We also have Mary McAleeso with us, the Athletics New South Wales Workforce Coordinator, and also Daniel Warren, who's the Little Athletics New South Wales Volunteer Manager and Business Analyst. And Daniel's going to be monitoring the chat box, so you might see him pop in every now and again to, to, to let us know what questions are being asked through the chat box. And of course, I will be introducing very soon our presenters, Kerry Smith and Neil Hinton, who I, we thank for all the work they've done in putting this presentation together, which will be fantastic. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all situated today. I'm here in North Parramatta, which is traditionally Darug land. Um, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here today. Now in a moment, I'm gonna pass over to our two presenters, Kerry Smith, and Neil Hinton to deliver this presentation. Now, Kerry has a long experience in coaching the throws and, and, and other events um, in both Little Athletics and, and beyond. Um, and Neil has an extensive experience as, as both an, an official and, and a coach in, in both Little Athletics and, and beyond. And, and both have and, and do deliver courses on behalf of both Little Athletics and Athletics New South Wales. So thank you very much, Kerry and Neil, for um, putting this together and being our presenters this evening. And I'm going to pass over to you now. Thanks for that, Kerry and Neil. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Darren. Um, I'm driving, so hopefully this is going to work for me. Um, it's, I'm sharing my screen, so that's a good start. I'm just going to just uh, put a little montage up and then we'll we'll start with a little bit of basics from the, the official point of view and then a little bit of um, you know my perspective in terms of the basics of the events um, and then we'll move through our presentation from there. So the throws. Yes, yeah, so as far as I'm concerned, there's two reasons why we're there as an official. And the first one, to provide that safe environment for athletes, I think is self-explanatory, but also to provide that same safe environment for officials to perform optimally. If you're not comfortable out in the fall area, say of the javelin, then you are not going to perform at your very best. So uh, as a senior official, it's a part of their job to make sure that people are out there feeling comfortable and can per perform to their best. Um, the second one there is to provide that level playing field. And that means that you treat every athlete exactly the same. You have a pretty good knowledge of the rules or better. And the best athlete on the day is determined. There's nothing hindering the performance of that athlete. And Kerry's going to talk about... Uh, from the coaching perspective. So in terms of the, the basics for the performance, so what the athletes obviously need to do is they need to be able to generate the maximum amount of um, power that they can through their body to impart onto the object that they're trying to throw as far as they possibly can within the confines of the rules of the actual event itself. And, you know, some of those are, are quite um, strict and others are a little bit uh, more flexible. Um, so in terms of that generation of power, um, the athletes are, are really trying to impart um, speed and strength. We've got that speed and strength element that they have to develop. Um, but, but in terms of, of, you know, when we talk about speed, we're talking about speed over a distance and, and applying that force over a distance. And the space that we're given is very clearly defined within the rules of the sport. So um, that generation of speed is, is limited in terms of that capacity. So Lots of things go into developing that strength and that power um, behind the scenes so that the athletes can perform to their best on the day. Um, the other thing that we really need to do, and these are very, very technical events, there's a lot of coordination of body parts and a lot of biomechanics that goes behind um, being able to achieve the best possible result on that particular day. Um, and that's crucial for success. Having said that, competition is very, very different to the training environment. And so, um, you know, there's so many variables that change the way that things happen um, in the competition environment. And so to be able to try and minimise all of those 
those impacts, the stress of, of actually being comp in a competitive environment that's going to impact how they perform the skill, um, you know, how other people are performing within their competition, where they're sitting in the competition, you know, whether they're letting down coaches, parents, all of those sorts of things are going through athletes' minds when they're actually in that competition environment. So um, what I do as a coach is I try to get them to focus on the things that they can control. So what they do in the runway is what they can control. What they do across the circle is what they can control. What they can't control is how far other athletes are throwing. So for me, it's really, really important. And that psychological element of the sport um, can't be understated. Um, the, you know, we can do as much practice outside and get that skill, you know, fine-tuned and, 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 you know, 99% of the time perform really well in training. But once we go into the competition venue, everything changes. So um it's really yeah it's something that i can't stress enough in terms of athletes and, and and particularly when they want to measure in training and i refuse to measure in training because measuring in training gives them a false sense of of what they can do when they're under pressure and so they, they're inevitably disappointed if we measure in training and then they're not performing to that that level within competition so i think that's a really really important sort of point to make and and, and just sort of let um, you know, people sort of think about, you know, that that track, that competition environment, trying to, to do the best that they possibly can there is not the same as when they're actually able to perform the skill in that, that learning environment. Some athletes thrive on competition and some athletes completely crumble in competition. So for me, being able to get all of those elements together is, is quite difficult. And, you know, the, the, the more that we can sort of create that environment that's more stable for the athletes in the competition environment, then I think that's that's really important. Um, Neil wants to talk about some safety in terms of the competition environment. Yeah, th this is a paramount thing, uh, safety for everyone. And of course, it's the athletes. We're there for them. We want them to be safe. But we've also got to look after the officials and we've got to consider in throwing events, which every one of the implements is actually designed to kill, we've got to make sure that the spectators are also safe. And if you think about any uh, meet that goes on, there's photographers, uh, a whole host of people wandering around the, the uh, stadium, we need to make sure that they're all supervised or at least safe. Um, and we work as a team. As a group of officials, we're not individuals. We're out there looking after each other and the athletes and the spectators, all as a team. We have each other's back, in other words. Now, the second dot point there, implements must be carried back. That's just not my thought. That is actually in the rules that an implement is never thrown back. Uh, to me, the reason for it is quite obvious. As I said earlier, they're meant to kill. Now, the warm up. Kerry and I both have a different definition of where warm-ups occur. Um, where in the rule book we talk about warm-ups and practice throws, that is what actually happens after the athlete has arrived at the event, whether it be under their own power or they've been brought down by call room. So once they're down on the field, those warm-ups, practice throws must be supervised. Now, Kerry will talk about the warm-up for her happens well and truly before the, uh, the athletes get down to the event area. Throwers, they take at least an hour to warm up, the older ones anyway, younger ones probably not quite so much. <laughs> There's two aspects to the warm up and to the practice throws, what occurs for Kerry and what occurs for me as an official. Um, in this day and age, I think we must be aware of providing shade for uh, the athletes who are out there for an hour or longer. Um, I once would have included in there providing water as well, but in this day of COVID and other health issues, uh, it's more up to the athletes now. They should be looking after themselves as far as bringing water out. Same goes for officials. And of course, the last one I think is self-explanatory. If the conditions are unsafe, that's the end of the event. In the case of a throw, it could be the um, the runway for the javelin is lifted just where the athletes are going to put their foot. And so if their spikes hit bare concrete, they're going to go for a slide. Hey, one extreme is, and I've actually seen it, discus cage falls down. Uh, so you've got to either change the area that the event's in or just cancel it. And uh, Kerry's going to talk now about her idea of warm-ups and uh, 
and the training environment. So what I've got here just is this is actually from the, um, the level one um, manual at the moment in terms of how we'd set up a safe environment to actually coach the, the skill element of the throws. Um, so here's, here's one way that we can, um, you know, be central as a coach to be able to look at different groups and, and having the ability to coach, you know, several different groups at, at a time. If we're looking at large groups of people we're trying to develop skills with and give them lots of practice because practice in terms of these technical events is really, really important to, to hone those skills. So that's just one way. If we want to be central, we can we can then work with those groups there. If we've got more space, um, we can move um, our groups further apart. And there are definite guidelines in the level one coaching manual talking about having, you know, at least five metres between groups. Um, you'll notice here I've got um, group one, group two, group three staggered so that um, the most common fault with throwers when they when they are practicing the skill is that they will actually release the implement early. So right-handed throwers, which are the predominant, you know, the majority of throwers are right-handed, will throw it out to the right early. So you'll see that the right-hand side of each of these groups of, of practice groups is um, is behind the the group to their left. And if we have left-handed throwers, then they're going to be on the left side of the group. And this is my my way of generally organizing groups when I, you know, particularly in schools, if I'm working with larger groups of, of athletes, I'll have a green set of cones, a red set of cones, you know, stop, go, um, and, and a no man's land between so that they know that there's not to be anyone between those cones and then you can really um, isolate where you want those athletes to be. Um, and then of course, all throw, all retrieve, carry implements back, um, and just getting into those really good habits of, of making sure that you've got that safe environment for for the practicing of the skills. So a quick overview of the event rules that are common to all of the throwing events. Most of these are covered under rule 25. Now that is in the new world athletics book. Uh, but when I go around places, I see more copies of the old IAAF rule books than I do the new one. And of course there is also the little A's rules of competition. Uh, which is in the process of being reorganised. So it's pointless at this stage looking at actual rule numbers for that book. Uh, so the athletes may use the competition area for a warm up and practice trials prior to the competition. It's no longer specified that they must get to, but that is the ideal that we aim for to give everyone two practice throws if they wish to take them. They should be done in competition order, and they must be supervised by the judges that are on duty at that uh, event. And uh, once again, safety is paramount. And during this period, you may not need to bring back every implement. A whole series can be thrown out there to start with and brought back as a big group. Uh, that is up to the judges who are on the event, how they want to organize that practice. Now, of course, it's always sort of implied that rules need to be varied because of the time limits or time restraints that when the athletes actually come down to the event. But we aim to try and give two every time. And I'm sure Kerry, as a coach, would love to see every one of her athletes get two practice throws. Yeah. Uh, can I jump in there now, Neil? Yeah, certainly, Kerry. That, that, was, that was our cue. Um, so this is where Neil talked about um, the difference between the, the warm-up throws at the, at the competition venue and the practice throws at the competition venue compared with a warm-up. Um, so for in this context where we're talking about those two practice throws, we, we're looking, from my perspective, I'm looking at my athletes being able to, you know, check their run-up run on that particular surface. You know, if, if they've warmed up, on grass outside the venue and then they're coming in and you know the, the surface you know behaves differently depending on the weather um, so making sure that their run-up is actually accurate on the on that particular day on, under those particular conditions the speed of the circle it might be a circle that they've not not performed in before so those those two practice throws are really really crucial um, just to, to sort of orient them to the competition on that particular day um, so in terms of a warm-up um, the warm-up for for any event. So basically, the, the more powerful, the more explosive, the shorter duration an event or a, a sport is, the longer the warm up will actually need to be. So when we're thinking about how long it takes to throw a shot or put a shot, 
um, you know, we're talking one to two seconds across the circle and, and in delivery. So um, the, the warm up for a shot putter can be up to an hour and a half. And that's, that's quite standard. So we're trying to get, you know, in, in terms of the, the um, purpose of a warm up is to try and get the body ready to perform at optimal level. If we want to perform at, at that speed and with that power, then we need to develop that over that period of time. So my athletes will go out at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half before the event. Um, and they will have spent a lot of time going through a whole range of activities to get them ready to fire fast in that competition environment. So, um, and I know that, you know, not, not everyone's aware of how long they've taken to go out there and prepare themselves to get into that. And it's not just a, a physical state, it's also a mental state to be ready for competition as well. So, um, yeah, those, those practice throws are crucial, but they're not warm-up throws. The warm-up happens a long way before that competition and that event, and it's, it's really important that they're actually able to, to, you know, if they get the two, all the better. If we can sneak an extra one in, that'd be great as well. Um, but, um, yeah, two is definitely really important just to, to solidify what they've done in that warm-up. Um, you know, if we're in, at Sydney, they've been at the warm-up track for potentially an hour and a half, getting themselves into that state. Um, and the other thing I did want to mention, and I forgot to mention earlier, is it's, it's you know, particularly with throws um, and big fields, there's a long time between um, throws. And so in terms of, you know, being able to park a, a bad throw or, a, you know, a poor performance, it's really important that the athletes have the ability to be able to keep the, their mental state and be able to, um, you know, self-talk and, and get positive self-talk and, and have the space to be able to do that at the event as well. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later, won't we, Neil? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so the athletes can use markers for all throwing events. Um, one or two markers can be used beside the runway for the javelin. And uh, the ideal is when they're provided by the organisers. If not, um, then the athletes can use their own markers. But once again, safety comes into that that an official should make sure that any self-brought down um, markers meet safety requirements. Um, in the circular throws, you can only use one marker and that must be placed immediately behind or adjacent to the circle. So it's behind the white line that goes through the centre of the circle. And it must be removed as soon as the athlete has finished their trial. And once the competition commences, more for javelin rather than the um, circular throws, no other markers can be used. The athletes can move them, but they can't add to the number of markers that are actually out there. We'll go to the next one, I think, Kerry. I think that's the rest of that for self-explanatory. Um, when an athlete enters a competition, their throwing order is by a random draw, and that is the comes down on the field sheets. That's the order that they will follow, and they'll throw in that order. But one of the major things with throwers, and I know Kerry has multi eventers and things like that, that athletes are competing in one or more events at the same time, and so the referee then has the power to alter that order within the set attempts. Um, to allow an athlete to go away, compete at another event, and then get back and hopefully not miss uh, one of their trials. So in a lot of events that uh, we see, an athlete might get the final throw in the last round, in uh, sorry, round one, and then may get another throw at the end of the next round, where in actual fact, he should have been halfway through the field somewhere. Um, the final round in a major championships, that does not occur. The athlete must throw in their order uh, as the final top eight has been determined. The completion of a trial, uh, and that's different for uh, each of the throws, how an athlete actually leaves the, the circle or leaves the runway. But when they've done it in accordance to the rules, the judge with the flags, raises a white flag to indicate a valid trial. The rules that govern the way an athlete can leave the circles covered by rule 32.17, uh, 
uh, and it's pretty specific as to how each event is conducted. Yeah, Kerry. The uh, time that's allowed for each trial is covered under Rule 25.17. Uh, and basically it is one minute for all of the throwing events. But the thing is, when does that trial actually begin? And a trial begins when the athlete's name has been called and that happens after everything is in readiness. And that is the officials are in position, um, the field, the landing area is safe and everyone is in a, a good position, ready to give the athlete the best chance of performing to their ability. Now, common sense needs to be used with this one at times because in javelin, a lot of the throwers go across the track. And if they're called but can't have their run, common sense needs to be used. Either the, the clock is stopped, uh, the athletes could be called in, they may be going back out again with their clock starting. But common sense, a word that... Uh, probably not used as often as it should be. We've got to look after the athletes so that they get to compete at the best level. If they're standing out there and they've got athletes coming past them and you've got an official saying, come on, come on, your, your time's running, they're going to be under stress. So as officials, we need to actually give them the best chance we can to, for them to compete at their best. Um, if the time is running, and an athlete actually starts to commence their throw before that one minute is up, that trial is allowed to, to proceed. Now, there's a yellow flag should be raised with 15 seconds to go to indicate to the athlete that their time is starting to wind down. Also, before the event, those athletes, if they need to be made aware of that flag and where it's going to be shown so that they can actually see it. The other way of doing things, of course, is to use the time clock and the time clock should also be in a position where the athletes can actually see it. Um, now, if the time one runs down and the athlete has not started their throw, that's usually recorded as a failure. Unless the referee who happens to be on the spot can see that there was some other reasons why uh, that rule should not apply. And basically the rule is there to stop athletes wasting time. If an athlete's time just does expire, but they haven't deliberately wasted time, the referee has that power to overrule that decision. We'll go on, Kerry. Um, I just wanted to um, make that point about that common sense. Um, I think that's really, really important. I remember uh, probably several years ago now, time seems to be moving very quickly as I get older. Um, that the, the Open Men's Javelin at the State Championships coincided with the, the mixed 10K one year. And that, you know, the, the athletes were just strewn the whole way around the 400 metre track. And it made it very, very difficult for those, those um, men to, to be able to actually find that gap in, um, in the, the, you know, the runners. And I, I do remember um, the official, um, you know, really trying to sort of, you know, keep, keep the athletes, you know, calm and, you know, after this person, you, you can go after the person in green or, you know, or whatever it was. And, and then all of a sudden the person behind the person in green sped up and, you know, it's, it's quite, you know, they're getting themselves into the zone. And, you know, that, that official really impressed me at that time, just really trying to, to, you know, make everything a little bit calmer and, and just talk them through so that they knew when they were going to be able to commence their attempt. And um, I think that's, that's really important because that time is, um, is really a stress on the athletes, having that time limit. Um, and, you know, a few years back, it, it was, you know, shortened for the juniors um, from a minute to, to 30 seconds between being called and having, having their attempt. And that, that made a very different competition at that particular point in time. So um, just to try and minimise that with my athletes, I, I, you know, make sure that they know their, their throwing order and I make sure that they start to get prepared and ready um, at least two to three throwers before their, um, their turn to have an attempt, which I think is really, really important just to, to, just to bring that, um, I guess, ritual into, you know, making sure that they're in control of a little bit more within, within the competition. Another example I have for that too in terms of safety was last week. I noticed there was a, an athlete who kept throwing wide in the hammer throw towards the back straight 
Um, so we waited for the back straight to be clear before we started the time on that, just because that athlete kept throwing wide towards that side of the track. So we just, yeah, use common sense there and let that prevail, give the, give the clearance time for the back straight and then let him throw. That way he didn't hit anybody accidentally. Excellent. And that's what we like, we like to see, that common sense prevailing. Yeah. <laughs> So the next graphic just illustrates the uh, that one minute for all of the throws. And of course it mentions the yellow flag and the visual clock again. So an athlete has put in a good performance, white flags being raised, and that, me that event, uh, that, sorry, that throw needs to be measured straight away. And there's rules. Uh, rule 10.2 that specifies what can be used to measure um, that attempt. And fortunately, these days we use the EDM a hell of a lot, uh, which makes life a lot easier than using the, the tape. But I will mention one thing there with the EDM that officials need to be aware that they're not looking back at the circle when they point the prism. They must look at the uh, EDM so the EDM can be read uh, quickly and efficiently. However, you still go to the nearest point that the implement is made uh, towards the circle. So you still go to that nearest point, but you just turn the prism in a different direction, depending on where the EDM actually is. Of course, if you're using a tape, the measurements are made to 0.01 metres below the distance if it's not a whole centimetre. EDM will do that automatically for you. Uh, now, the measurement for a circle, circular throw, it's made along a straight line to the centre of the circle, from the nearest mark to the circle made by the fall of the shot discus or the hammerhead in the landing area. That's the zero end of the tape. And that tape is then drawn back in a straight line through the centre of the circle that it's read from the inside edge of uh, the metal band or the stop board in case of shot. Now, when I say it's drawn back straight, it doesn't have to be pulled super tight. I'll put on my other hat as a uh, club treasurer uh, who hates to spend money on tapes that get pulled apart by people who get a little bit overzealous and really pull the things and, and destroy that little metal loop on the end. So straight, Yes, but not overly tight. So for the javelin, it's really actually the same because the eight metre mark that's in the centre of the javelin runway is actually the centre of an eight metre circle that forms the front edge of the throwing arc. So the principle is exactly the same. You draw the tape back from the nearest mark, uh, which is the zero, the zero end, back through that eight metre mark, which is indicated by a little triangle on the runway. And it's read from the inside edge of the throwing arc. We can go on from that, I think, unless you want to add something to that one, Kerry. Um, what I also like to see happen if it's being measured with a tape is um, the person that's pulling the tape through that eight metre mark actually checking by taking eight metres off the measurement when the, the measurement's called. I think that's a, a really good double check. I um, think it applies to all in that one, Kerry, because we know the, the diameter of the shot circle. We know the diameter of the um, discus circle. Um, yeah, and, and it's something I like to do. I might be out with the centimetres, but I like to see the metres. And it's, a, it's a, just a double check, I think, where everyone's watching each other's back. Beautiful. So a few other things there that the officials are responsible for. They need to uh, advise the athletes of the order in which they're going to compete. Now, the athletes may already know this from programming, but there could actually be some changes. And of course, if they haven't been informed in the entry information or the technical regulations, need to be informed the, of the number of trials that they'll be allowed to take. Uh, and of course, this can be varied for all the different levels of events. Major events, usually always eight, but I know there's a lot of events where 
every athlete gets three attempts and the top eight or top six get one only extra throw. Um, so in the case of a six trial competition, if there are fewer than eight athletes, then they will all get six trials. Whether they've made valid attempts or not, they will get all six trials. Where there are more than eight athletes, only those who make at least one valid trial during the first three rounds can be considered to be placed in the top eight. And this could mean that there's less than eight athletes participating in the final three rounds. And of course, there's rule 25.22, which specifies how athletes who are tying for the last qualifying place can be determined. So for the first three rounds of any competition, the athletes compete in the order that they're drawn in, unless of course the referee gives permission for those athletes to compete out of order because they're competing somewhere else. Um, after the third round, the athletes that compete, the top eight athletes who complete in rounds four, five and six are placed in reversed order in that event for the final three rounds. So the last, the first placed athlete is the last thrower in that event. And Kerry, you want to ask me something there? No, I, I, wanted, I wanted to make a point. Am I echoing? Because I just... Yes, you're right. You can am I good you. now? Yep. Um, so so in, um, in that instance, sometimes when I'm, you know, at an event um, and, you know, because where the coaches are allowed to be, um, is not necessarily, you know, getting the best picture of what's going on in the competition. We're really only looking at our own athletes. Um, if we've got an athlete that's very focused on their competition and they're not really paying attention to what's going on around them, um, it can be, um, you know, into round four when I might know where my athlete's sitting in terms of based on the fact that the, the order's been reversed. So I might know they're sitting fourth or fifth um, because they haven't, you know, they haven't, paid attention to anything else that's going on. They might know what their performances were, but if, if they're not having a good day, sometimes they may not even know that. Um, and so I, I would like to make the point that, that in the absence of a scoreboard, which we don't always have the luxury of enough officials to have a scoreboard where, you know, we're seeing the distances being turned around to the coaches um, so we know how our athletes are performing, um, it really is nice when we have those those proactive officials that that call back as they're recording and, and call back the, the, the performance and the distances um, so that we can hear and, and know where they're actually performing and how they're going. Um, so I just wanted to sort of to mention that. I know some people may ask for that and they don't necessarily do that in a very um, diplomatic way, but it would, you know, it's something that's really, really useful to coaches being on the sideline to, to hear how our athletes are performing as they've been recorded in recording sheets. Yeah, so that was just well, something I wanted to make there. It's certainly not a state secret or shouldn't be a state secret what the measurement is. Um, and I know some officials actually try their best. They've got louder voices than some of the other ones. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's something important. And athletes, as you said, Kerry, when they're in the zone, don't always know where they are in that competition. Might know their own performance, but they're focusing on what they did in their throw rather than listening to what the next measurement is for the next athlete. Um, so there's another thing there too, where to keep a competition going, an athlete who has been fouled for some reason or other, but is protesting, can be allowed to stay in that competition to keep the competition going. And then the referee will make a final determination after the event. Um, so it, again, it is to preserve the rights of the athlete and try to give them the best possible conditions. So in all competitions, an athlete who makes a valid trial gets a white flag, the distance is then measured and it's recorded on the recording sheet in the relevant space. And it's one thing where as officials, you need to look at uh, getting the athlete's performance in the right place. If an athlete passes, indicate it with a horizontal dash so that you don't get confused and end up putting another athlete's measurement in that place. So we need to be 
always aware that not every athlete is going to throw in every round and we can't muddle up the sheet uh, because we're doing the wrong thing by the athlete. We're putting them under stress if they have to come up and say, hey, that's not what I threw. I threw something else. And um, I, I just don't like to see an athlete put under stress. If an athlete fails to make a valid throw, they get an X on the recording sheet. It's something I think, Kerry, we see a lot at schools where we get P's, F's, and all sorts of other things. And we, we do our utmost, utmost best to go around and try to get people to put in that X or the horizontal dash for a pass. Now I say often enough, if you put a P and an F, the two of them can be very misleading. We can go on. So at the uh, end of an event, the athlete is credited with his or her best result. That is the longest throw that they've achieved in that competition. If the athlete fails to make a valid trial in that competition, they get no measure in their best result column. And of course, they cannot get a place. There might only be 10 athletes in the play in the event, but if one of them has got no measure at all, he cannot get 10th place. The results only go down to nine. If an athlete fails to participate, they're actually on the score sheet, but don't turn up, then it's a DNS for did not start. And um, I just said about uh, any athlete who hasn't got a result, it's just a horizontal dash in their place because they can't be allocated a place. Now, if we have two athletes, and this goes all the way down from first place to 30 if necessary, the athletes are attempt, or we attempt to um, place those athletes by a count back system where we look at the second best throw. If they're still the same, we go back to the third best throw and so on until we finally can arrive at a placing. Um, and if we can't, then we may actually have equal placings. Okay, move on, thanks, thanks, Kerry. Just a graphic there of a, uh, a basic recording sheet uh, where at the end of round three, the best performance is put down. Then the athletes, you can see there, the athlete that was coming first, then there's a, uh, a slash eight. It means the athlete is in first position at the end of round one, and they will be the eighth thrower in the competition. And it goes all the way down there to the bottom. Fourth place person is throwing fifth. And as a little guide that um, for you to do that reverse ordering, the uh, two numbers add up to nine. One, eight equals nine, three, six, nine, and so on. And um, at the end of the competition, those throws are not deleted. They are still valid throws. So you can see in the case of Ali at the top, through 70.91 in the uh, first three rounds, and then had three fouls, but he did not lose that 70.91, cannot disappear. He's achieved that on the day. And the same goes there for every other athlete. Um, geez, no one seems to have improved on that. Sorry, I lie. Ben threw 70-31 in the first three rounds and he actually improved with a 70-91 in his final three attempts. Uh, the referee has all sorts of powers. And if they believe an athlete was obstructed, hampered, or didn't receive the best of conditions to make their trial, uh, the referee may award an athlete a replacement trial. Also, the power of the referee includes um, the fact that they can change the place of competition if they can, ju can justify the conditions uh, are no longer safe. That change should only happen at the end of a round, so that all athletes are competing under the similar conditions before the, the event site is moved. And as we said way back in safety, after each throw in the competition, the implement must be carried back 
either by hand or by machine, but it should never be thrown and that is actually covered under the rules. Now, entering the circle, this is one that uh, the rules say there is no way that you can, there is no restriction on the way that you can actually enter the circle. So you can enter from the front, the side, the back, same occurs on the javelin runway. Um, but before the trial can actually start, the athlete must adopt a stationary position. And that stationary position is the athlete takes both feet on the ground. It doesn't specify, or no rule specifies how long they need to stay on the, the ground with both feet there, but both feet and nothing is concerned about their arms. They can be swinging their arms around, but the two feet must stay on the ground in a stationary position. Then the throw commences as soon as they move from that position. Um, the athlete can touch the inside rim of the circle. Uh, in the case of the shot put, they can also touch the inside of the stop board. While I said there is no requirement for how you enter the circle, I know as a lot of coaches would actually say, go in the back, go out the back. It's trying to instill in the mind of the athlete that, hey, they must follow the next rule, which specifies how you actually leave the circle. And of course, I said earlier, the javelin runway is really a segment of a circle. So leaving the circle after the trial, the Athlete cannot leave the circle or the runway until the implement has actually landed. Then they must leave by the rear half of the circle as defined by the white line that extends out from the throwing circle. And the first contact must be on the ground or the rim behind that line. Um, I know as a thrower, I used to upset, try to upset officials a fair bit. I'd put one foot behind the line and my second step would be on the wrong side of the line to try and catch officials out. Uh, that was just my sense of humour. Um, but it's first contact. What you do with the second contact, that's anyone's business. There used to be a rule once that you had to leave under um, control. I was actually yeah. fouled for leaving a circle not under control, even after that rule was taken out. The fact that I fell out the back of the circle, the throw was absolute rubbish. So I didn't protest on that. I was quite happy to have it called a foul. Um, on the javelin runway, uh, we go to the next one, I think, Kerry. Ah, don't know why we didn't have a um, something there on javelin. We must have left it into the javelin section, I think, Kerry. But uh, I will just mention that um, once the javelin has landed, the athlete can leave the runway. They must do it completely behind the throwing arc. And they can leave it at any point they like along that runway. There is, however, a four metre mark, four metres back from the front of the uh, throwing arc. It is purely there to speed up the event because a lot of athletes, when they throw the jab, as Kerry knows, some of her athletes have done it, they get pumped up. It's a, a big excitement. They can see that the throw is massive. So what do they want to do? They want to walk straight back that runway to their coach, who's standing way back there behind their arm. Um, and so what are the officials doing? We cannot raise a white flag until the athlete has left the runway. So we could be standing there for five minutes while that athlete goes back, has a chat to his coach, and he technically still hasn't left the runway. But once they have walked back past that four metre mark, we're entitled to put up a white flag and give the okay to that, um, that throw. Doesn't happen very often with little kids, but certainly with older athletes who really achieve and get pumped up, it's, it's a big bonus to speed up the event. Um, okay, so some of the things that an athlete can't do, they can't modify any implement during the competition. So what is modifying the implement? Picking the grip on the javelin, 
scratching the surface of the shot put. I've actually seen that uh, at a Commonwealth Games. Uh, an Indian athlete had a ring with a sharp little edge on it. And every time the shot put came back, she was picking it up, scratching the surface and putting some deep scratches in it. Um, an official was awake and could see that the shot put was changing its condition between each throw. And that was actually then removed from competition. Um, discus, you know, you can pop that center. You can do sort of things with the discus to make it fly a little bit differently. So any modification uh, is illegal and the athlete can actually be warned if they're caught doing some of those things. You cannot use any illegal device or taping that provides any assistance outside the rules. So in the case of javelin, you can't use a glove. Same in um, shot put discus, you can't use a glove. Whereas in hammer, you can actually use a glove it's not considered illegal assistance. Um, and you also can't spray or spread any substance on the circle or roughen the circle. Uh, I have known some athletes that have gone to little out of the way grounds and they, before they throw, go down with a brick and actually roughen the surface. Um, guess in some ways they get away with that because it's not actually during the competition. And of course, the last one there, a cartwheeling technique in moving across the circle in the shot put. How a 140 kilo man is going to cartwheel and throw a shot and keep it against his neck, I don't know, but it is in the rules to prevent that happening. Other things that they may do, but these aren't illegal, they can use taping on their hands and fingers, providing they show the chief judge and it is approved. Now, the tape can be continuous, going from one finger to the other, but two fingers cannot be taped together. And in the case of the, um, the hammer, the gloves cannot have the fingers still in place. The fingers must be cut off. Oh, the fingers of the glove, not the actual athlete's fingers. Um, so that the chief judge can actually look down those holes and see that the that each hole actually has a finger in it. The fingers aren't taped together. You're also allowed to put a substance on your hands, your neck, or your gloves to improve your, your grip. And in the case of the shot and discus, you can play chalk, place chalk actually on the implement. Uh, brought in as a change several years ago, where once you couldn't put a, any chalk on the implement, but athletes were actually spitting on their hands, putting their hands in the chalk, and then it was actually transferring to the shot or discus without them deliberately doing it or appearing to deliberately do it. And of course, who wants to pick up a shot after some uh, athlete has been spitting on the implement? So uh, it's now legal to place the chalk on the implement. Yes, and I'm listening to the Zoom meeting. Yeah, I'm listening to the Zoom meeting. So an athlete can actually uh, interrupt a trial once it's started, and then they can be begin it again, providing that their time has not elapsed. So that one minute is still running, even though the athlete interrupts their, their trial. And uh, of course, they can leave the circle, they can put the implement down, but if they wish to leave the circle, they must do so correctly, i.e. walk out the back. Uh, how they walk back in again is entirely up to them. Uh, I know um, Kerry has seen examples of athletes being fouled uh, that they've interrupted their trial in the javelin, turned around to walk back to their mark and have been fouled because they've actually turned their back to the run to the um, throwing area. Uh, that is not in the spirit of the rules. The spirit of the rule is to give the athlete the best possible conditions to compete in. And it's obvious, or should be obvious, that an athlete has decided not to throw um, and they go back to their, their mark. Be correct in that, Kerry, that you've seen that, that happen? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about that when we talk about the um, oh, sorry, officials. Adam, yeah. jumped in. Yeah, that's all right. Um, yeah, I have. Um, and that was, you know, what, when we were talking about, you know, what are the things we look for when we're looking at a, a, an official that we consider to be a good official is that, you know, knowing why those rules are in, and we, we we're going to talk about them when we get to Javelin. So, um, yeah, why, why the rules have been put into play and, and then going, okay, well, within the spirit of that rule, Am I going to call that a foul? Well, it's it's not a it's not a foul based on why that rule turning it back on direction of throw um, is in there. It's to do with the fact that it's not um, in the old days there were unorthodox um, techniques that were used. So I think we we need to sort of um, maybe move through a little bit quicker. Um, Neil, yeah, go for it, mate. Get to that. Yep. Next slide. I think we've covered that one pretty well. Okay, so it's not a, a failure, assuming no other rule is infringed if the hammer or the discus hits the cage before landing correctly within the sector. It's also uh, not a failure, assuming once again, no rule, other rule is infringed, that uh, up to the point in the trial, if during the throw, the implement actually breaks. The rules actually specific, specifically only refer to this in the case of the hammer and the jav, because they're the ones probably more likely to break. But of course, um, a discus can come apart. I've yet to see a shot put uh, actually break during the course of a trial, but who knows, maybe it's possible. Uh, Kerry, you had something there. Yeah, yeah. so there's the, there is that note um, about touching the circle at the back of the circle in the first turn. Can you just quickly explain that? Yes, yes, okay. So the rule actually says that you can't touch the, um, the rim or the ground outside the, the circle. Um, and it's actually specified in Rule 32.13, um, but, sorry, um, 32.144, that rule is. And the rule actually says that you can't touch any part of your body, uh, the lines which mark the runway or the ground outside in the case of the javelin, or the metal band or stop board, top of the stop board in the case of um, shot put, or the metal band in discus. So that's the actual rule, but there is actually a note to the rule that says it shall not be considered a failure if the discus or the head of the hammer strikes the far side, oh, sorry, wrong one, <laughs> um, if it's on the first turn be behind the white line, so it's in the rear half of the circle, if the athlete is actually in their first rotation, in the case of shot or discus, they can actually scrape the ground and or the metal band around that. Does that clarify that one, Kerry? It's only the first rotation. Yep, so from my perspective. And, oh, sorry, one other point to that before I let you go on. Um, they can't get any advantage out of it. And, and I, would, I would see that if they're hitting the ground and they're trying to move forward, that's going to actually impede their, their movement towards the front of the circle. So Actually, I agree, totally agree with that. And... Uh, I don't think it's in the best athletes, the best interest of the athlete if they do touch. But we should not foul them if it does actually happen on the first rotation and it's in the rear half of the circle. Thanks, Neil. <clears throat> oh, classic throwing position. I think any coach would have to agree that that is absolutely ideal. And not something we see a lot with our young kids um, no. in terms of where, where that shot is, but that's, um, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, so all of the rules specific to the shot put are covered under Rule 33. And it covers the style of putting. And the shot must be put from the shoulder with one hand only. That is very specific. And when beginning the shot, the shot to shall touch or be in close proximity to the neck or the chin. A little A's go to, so far as to specify that close proximity is less than two fingers. So if you can stick two fingers between the shot and the neck, that isn't close proximity. How you actually measure that when the athlete's actually in the process of throwing, very difficult. Um, and you certainly would not stop the athlete, walk over to them and say, geez, can I stick two fingers in there to see if that's in close proximity? It is what you perceive as close proximity. And the hand shall not be dropped below this position during the put. So once you've taken that stance, where the shot is, doesn't have to touch the neck, 
because remember the rules were written for open men, uh, you know, 140, 150 kilo men who don't have necks. So close proximity is really what you make of it. And of course, the chin is mentioned there as well. So once the shot takes that position, it should not be dropped below that position, nor should it be taken back behind the line of the shoulders during the put. And of course, we said it earlier, you cannot do any cart wheeling at any time. Um, you want to add something, anything there to that one, Kerry? Yeah, yeah. I think you go on, we've got a little bit of stuff there on, um, on Hammer, but can we move to the next slide just to talk about, you know, how yes, from a coach's yeah. perspective, how I really emphasize the teaching and making sure that we, that, you know, we've got the shot in the right place to, to make it easy to, to actually put forward as opposed to dropping it behind the line of the shoulder. Um, so are you okay if I skip through this one? Yeah, yeah skip through to the next one, Kerry. Okay, so this is... This is pretty standard of what I see when, when um, young athletes start to throw shot. Um, it's, it's often taught to, to put the shot, to, to place the shot. Um, and, and often up here behind the ear, I don't know how many of you can actually see me, so I'm actually demonstrating this as well. But if it's up there behind the ear, um, we're already getting quite close to behind the line of the shoulder compared with where you would have seen Valerie had the shot tucked under her chin. So when I'm actually teaching and coaching this event, um, actually placement of shot where it's not being held by the athlete themselves and it's actually being sitting on the collarbone under the chin means that it's more of a push as opposed to then bringing it forward um, with the, the potential of that elbow dropping. You know, it's going to come away from the neck because of the weight of the shot being held by that athlete. Um, so in terms of, you know, combating that rule and, and teaching the technique, I think it's really important that that skill is taught well from an early age. Um, in terms of that shot placement, because we, you know, Neil and I have talked about this particular image quite a bit over the last couple of days. And for me, looking at where that shot's placed there, um, that's a recipe for being fouled. Neil, would you like to add? Yeah, look, um, as, as an official, we should not um, prejudge what's going to happen with that throw. And looking at that still, I can't see a reason why you would foul her to start with because it is reasonably in close proximity to the neck. It's certainly not behind the line of the shoulder, but like you, I would be looking at that athlete quite closely, certainly during practice throws. And maybe after seeing a practice throw, I might have a word to her, but um, the head would have to be pulled back one hell of a long way for her hand to clear her ear and face. And in doing so, as you said, that elbow has got to drop. If the elbow drops, that girl is going to have the, the shot pulled away from that position that, she, that it's in now. It'd be a very good effort for her to pull her head away and keep that shot in that position. Yeah, especially in light of the fact that, that shots are heavy. Yes. You know, for, for whatever age of the person that's throwing them, they're, they're a heavy implement. So... Um, in, yeah, combating that, I think it's really important for that skill to be taught in a way that it's much easier to, to, to do the push because that's what the put is, it's a push. And you can see where her fingers are behind the shot um, has to clear yeah, the head. The they're head under, they're to almost underneath as opposed to behind. Yeah. yeah, so there's no way she's going to be able to push that past her head without moving the head out of the way. Um, then we had another image, Neil, that we, we were going to just talk about, you know, how you would actually judge it potentially based on the fact that it is a still image and you had a few thoughts on that one? Yeah, yeah, put that one up, Kerry. And um, as Kerry said, it's a still image. We don't know at which part of the throw that is actually occurring. There is certainly a separation. The arm carrying the shot hasn't come back behind the line of the shoulder. Uh, the elbow may have dropped a little bit, but looking at the hips and the fact that the shoulders may be coming around, I would be, just based on that still, thinking that the head is pulled away but the hand hasn't actually moved. Um, if there was a video, I may have a different opinion, but from what I see there, I think, yeah, maybe there's some technique problems, but the throw is probably legal at that point. So 
main reasons for a discus throw being declared a foul is that the athlete hasn't started from a stationary position. And we said about that earlier before, right? So it's in the circle, the athlete has entered the circle. They must stop, have both feet on the ground. There is no time specified for how long they hold that position. And it is purely where their feet are, not anything to do with what they're doing with upper body or their arms. And of course, there after stepping into the circle to make the throw, any part of the body touches the top of the rim or the ground outside, outside the circle. I've just said that there is a note to the rule that says on the first rotation, you can actually scrape the ground or the iron band uh, behind the white line. And of course, it's a foul if you fail to leave the circle before the implement has landed or you step out on the front half of that white line that marks the centre. It's also a foul. The same goes for shot put in this case as well. If the implement touches the sector line or the ground outside the sector line on landing. After it's landed, if it's entirely within the sector line, it can roll do whatever it likes, touch the lines then, but it is on first contact with the ground that you're actually looking for. And of course, you can be fouled for uh, infringing the assistant rules, which of course is illegal taping, taping two fingers together or using a glove in the case of the discus, or you spray any substance on your shoes, the circle, or you roughen the circle. And of course, if you exceed the time limit, that one minute, um, and as I said earlier, Providing you've started your trial when the time expires, you're allowed to continue. But if you have not started at the elapse of the time, then it should be ruled a foul in most cases. And the final one there breaches the clothing or footwear rules. Uh, of course, athletes should be checked in call room. They should be checked before the event. So that should not happen. But I have seen instances where athletes have brought down um, items of clothing in particular that is not sponsored by the actual event organisers. And they actually wear that, put it on, might be a towel that has uh, got a brand logo on it. Um, so if it's seen, they're told to put it away. But if they refuse to do that or bring it out again, they certainly should be warned and possibly uh, one of their attempts failed while that is out visible. Rule 38 covers all of this of the jab, and this is probably uh, a fairly contentious one in a lot of ways. Um, to be an orthodox throw, the throw's got to be made over the shoulder or the upper arm. And of course, the rule was brought in, uh, as Kerry knows, I know, and probably a lot of other people know that there was over the years, attempts to throw the javelin by holding it by the tail, doing a discus spin, um, also using soap and things like that on the tail of the jab and holding the tail of the jab. And so the rule really started, I think, probably in the early 50s to take shape as to be um, defining what an orthodox throw is, and that is it must be thrown from the grip, must be thrown over the shoulder or the upper arm and your back can't be turned until the javelin is in the air. After that, then the athlete uh, can't leave the runway till the javelin lands. And of course, on landing, the javelin must land tip first, does not have to stick in the ground like a lot of people and a lot of schools actually believe. It is where that metal head, the tip of the metal head actually makes contact with the ground. And of course, we mentioned the four metre mark on the runway earlier, how an athlete can actually leave the runway. So the main reasons for a foul being declared in the javelin, after stepping onto the runway to make the throw, any part of the body touches the white lines or the ground outside the runway. If you make contact with the throwing arc or the ground in the landing area, so that is your step over the front line, fail to leave the runway correctly or before the implement has landed. If the javelin in contact in the ground when it first lands touches the sector line or the ground outside, that is a foul. And of course, the javelin does not land tip first. 
Uh, many a time we see a javelin land tail first, does a cart well and ends up landing or even sticking in the ground. Um, you have to be aware, awake, that which part of the javelin actually hit the ground first. And of course, any illegal taping or the use of gloves uh, infringes the assistance rule and would be declared a foul. Now that could be declared one foul at a time. So if the athlete removes the taping, their next throw is probably going to be okay, unless they breach some other rule. And of course you can't spray any substance on your shoes or on the runway uh, or actually roughen the runway. Um, why you would want to roughen a, long, a javelin runway, it's beyond me, but it is actually in the rules. And of course the time limit comes in, uh, exactly the same for all other throws. And if you breach the clothing or footwear rules, once again, that can be ruled a foul. So for me, oh, sorry, I've just got echo. Does anyone else got echo? Okay. Um, so in terms of the, the rule, the orthodox um, throwing, it's for me, that's, that's an issue of safety. We've got a long implement that we're trying to throw in a straight line that if we don't throw, with the athletes don't throw over the shoulder or upper arm, we're actually creating a much wider implement, which is then creating greater air resistance, which is then being transferred, the force has been transferred back through the athletes, firstly elbow and then the shoulder. And we see so many injuries of the elbows um, where athletes are not actually getting the elbow to lead the throw and allowing the, the hinge joint of the elbow to act as a hinge. They're putting a rotational force on that elbow. Um, and we do see quite a lot of people with elbow guards and, and injuries as a result of, of not throwing in a, a really good orthodox way. So I spend a lot of time, um, you know, with a lot of technical um, elements trying to get the, the elbow leading the throw so that the throw does um, come over the shoulder or the upper arm. And in, in some cases, I really try and emphasize that the, the javelin's almost going over the head so that we can hit the javelin through the point. Um, I asked Neil to have a look at this and what he thought about this is this is the same day. We were, obviously, this athlete's getting the, the, the hand over the head, you know, coming over the, the shoulder or upper arm nicely. As soon as we put the stick in their hand, um, we've got now a javelin that's quite wide going through the air because once there's angle, we've got a wide, a, a, you know, more force and air resistance that's going through that javelin and then coming back into the body. And I wanted Neil to sort of um, tell me what he thought about whether or not this was actually passing over the shoulder or upper arm. From that still, it probably looks like it is, but if I was side on, I'd have a better idea if I saw that the elbow was coming through first. Um, but if I was actually out in the fall area on that one, I'd be starting to question whether that is actually a sling. Um, I think I in, the, really in the shadow, we can see the elbows leading that throw. I think we can, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's okay. probably over the shoulder where the hand is there now. But in the case of a lot of slings, before it reaches that point, the hand has actually gone underneath the shoulder or upper arm and then rises up after passing through that point. Um, probably the position of his hand would indicate that it's still okay. I guess as a, a coaching point of view, you wouldn't like to see that, nor would I, the way that looks like it's being thrown. But I think by the rules, it's probably okay. And I think um, also similar to that shot, the, the falling away to the left side makes yeah. that look like it's a lot further away from the body than, than it actually is. So and I think that's what your eye is actually drawn to the fact that that body is falling away. And that accentuates the fact that the javelin is a long way out from his body. It's certainly not like what I want to see at all. No. Um, yeah, I, I think a coach should actually have a word to that boy, but um, uh, he's probably going to get a white flag, get through the competition, and I hope that um, he actually listens to his coach and improves that technique a little bit better. 
Um, just so I'm sure he will, Kerry. I'm sure he will. <laughs> I know you'll have a word to him in his little shell like. So these are these are some of the things that I try and do just to sort of really emphasize that, you know, shoulder or upper arm and, and safe throwing. Um, for me, it is all about the safety, particularly with um, javelin where, you know, little A's now, they're, they're introducing it, or they have for the last few years, in under 11s. Um, so it's really important that, that, you know, that safe technique's really taught um, because we want them to, to enjoy the event and, and stay in the sport. I guess it, this uh, emphasizes a bit too, Kerry, as you talked about earlier, that all of the drills at training all look good, but once the adrenaline starts to pump in competition, uh, because in that previous slide, that, that young fellow there looked really good in the drill, but once, the com or once it looked like it was a competition throw, um, some of the technique just fell away. Things I change just, uh, quite significantly the moment you put a javelin in their hand. They can do things with a ball, they can do things with yep. a band, but once it's, 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 it's a long implement to try and control. Uh, look, even 400 grams for someone who isn't physically developed is still a hell of a lot of weight. It's also the length. I think the length's an issue. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, once it turns in the wrist. All right. So what makes a good official? Um, do you want me to start? Oh, you'll probably say the same word that I'm going to say with, and it starts with a C. So away you go. So just a quick little bit of context. This is um, Ray Anderson, for those of you who don't know her. And she, was, um, she went down to Illawarra. Um, quite a few years ago, obviously, this is um, just early 2016. Um, and this is where she qualified to go to Rio um, in the Paralympics. And this was, you know, this was, this photo just really jumped out at me as to how, you know, how happy um, and how supportive everyone was at the Illawarra when she actually did get the qualifying performance under their watch to actually, um, you know, make it to, to the team to go to Rio. So um, for me, a, a good official is, someone that sort of allows the athlete to be able to be focused, allows them to be able to, um, you know, um, feel like they're being supported in, in trying to um, perform their best in, in the competition. They obviously know the rules and they apply those rules, but they apply them within the spirit of the rule as opposed to the letter of the law. And they had that understanding, particularly with javelin and, you know, orthodox throwing. Um, they're consistent. So, you know, if, if, if they're, if they're going to err on the side of caution for the athlete, if they've got an iffy flat landing, then they're going to do that for everybody, not just, you know, their favourites. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're not overly officious or overly intimidating, but they're also not overly friendly and, and sort of in the athlete's space, you know. Um, if the athlete's trying to focus, sometimes that's a little bit of, um, you know, that, that can be off-putting as well. Um, Doc said about this, um, consistent in their judgments. Um, and, the, and the other thing from a coaching perspective, what I really encourage my athletes always to do is to actually thank every individual official at those events um, because, you know, everyone plays a role in whatever, whatever they've been able to perform and do on that day. And, you know, there's always positives to draw from any competition, even if there is disappointment. So it's, it's important that, you know, they leave that competition and they leave the, the officials um, you know, feeling like they're valued as well and that, that you know, that they've contributed to, to whatever performance that they've done on the day. Um, so that's from my perspective. I don't think I've missed anything that we've talked about. No, look, I think, I think, Kerry, that that word consistent was the one that we would both go with. Uh, I'd probably throw in a good knowledge of the rules. And then, as you sort of said, then how they apply that rule and how it's applied consistently. You also mentioned um, intimidation. To me, an official who gets down on their haunches to study where the foot is in relation to the rim on the discus or the shot put, that is intimidating to the athlete because the athlete is going to feel that that official is there deliberately to actually foul them. And uh, I don't think that is providing the best uh, environment for an athlete to compete in. If they walk into the circle, feeling that, hey, this guy is trying to really foul me, they're not going to perform. Their mind is already on something else. And, of course, the application of common sense, thats that, I think, is a key word. Yeah, and I have had, had situations where athletes have, have been, their whole demeanour has changed when they've seen certain people on panels. Yes. Um, because of, of previous experiences. So, um, and, and possibly not even intentional. You know, it's just that... that 
they weren't able to perform because of just something little that may have occurred at that particular event. Um, and as we both uh, talked about over the oh, probably, I don't know, years, um, the fact that our athletes come back to us and actually criticise some of the officials, but they would never actually treat that official any differently because they don't want to upset the official. But we actually know probably a little bit about some of the officials that um, the athletes are willing to share with us. And it's all based on their experience and whether they think that athlete is actually giving them the best environment to compete under. And I, I know another thing we talked about is that um, that over-friendliness of an official with an athlete at times is detrimental because an athlete comes down in the zone they don't want to be asked how their brother, sister or mum, dad are. They're in the zone. They want to focus entirely on that throw. Now, if they come up and talk to you, that's a different matter altogether. And post-event, once again, completely different. But uh, pre-event and during the event, I think the athletes actually deserve to have their own space and their own privacy. Okay, Kerry and Neil, thank you for that. Sorry, I, I, I think that's the last slide from what I saw of the slide. Yes, yeah, yeah, there, mate. There. We've, sorry, we've gone over time. Ah, uh, look, look, I do appreciate your insights um, during this this session, and and certainly thank you for your for your presentation and the um, the effort you put into um, putting these this presentation together. I do hope people have have enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, for, the, for those people who have participated tonight and in, in and, and watched the presentation, um, a recording is is being made, and I will turn that off in a moment. In fact, what I'll do is for those people watching the recording, thank you for for watching, and 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 we hope that you found it useful.